Kuka sunarai sunarai enti 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 Hello, welcome to the first episode of the Pondside Talk and Debate. So this is both an uh, offline and online event. Uh, the format is, um, we have four speakers. The theme today is um, Eros and Spirit from a tantric and non-tantric perspective. So already this name has created some confusion. Is it classic tantra? Is it neo-tantra? I will let the speakers clarify. Um, the format will be two hours, so we're going to start with a 15 minutes monologue each. Santoshi went, might cut the talk a little bit shorter and do something else. Um, then half an hour debate. So I don't want to polarize in already super polarized world, but the little bit of disagreement is always interesting, right? A little bit of uh, different point of view and... Uh, so I'm not going to say the red team against the black team, but uh, <laughs> OK. So I will now, we will uh, start with, um, I will introduce the speakers for their 15 minutes monologue. Uh, we will start with Marianne. Marianne Costa holds a, an MA in comparative literature and is a renowned expert in the fields of symbolism, tarot, and trans transgenerational psychology. Together with Alejandro Jodorowsky, she authored the international bestseller, The Way of Tarot, and Meta Genealogy. She has written several books translated in various languages and collaborates with various institutions and museums. Most recently, with Cent uh, Centro Cultural Canduque in Madrid, Guggenheim Collection in Venice, and Academia di Belle Arti in Palermo. I could pronounce the last one better. Um, her polyfacetic career includes being a professional actress and singer, writing and translating poetry, novels and essay, working with theater and dance companies as a dramaturg and teaching worldwide. She has been a passionate tango dancer and singer for the last decade. Welcome, Marianne. So um, I just spent a week in agony because having 15 minutes to talk about a subject that has been, I mean, <laughs> um, a complete mystery for the last 30 centuries for the greatest sages and saints and who no one has been able to resolve is a very interesting challenge. Um, and so I've decided to lean upon the... When I don't know where to turn, I turn to the tarot. I'm talking about the Tarot of Marseille, which is basically, I mean, these cards that I brought, I brought only two, don't worry. Uh, they come from, um, uh, from a game from the very early 18th century, so they were actually playing cards. But the Tarot is, for those of you who don't know it, it's kind of a visual summary of the wisdom, wisdom of the West. So I was reflecting on the dynamics and relationship between eros and spirit, and we would have to define eros and define spirit, which is already quite a task. And I realized that there's actually two cards in the tarot that kind of show us the perspective. The first is card number six called the lover, which I will describe for the podcast. It shows three people on the ground I mean, standing, but on the ground level, who are kind of ugly in traditional tarot. They're not supposed to be pretty. One of them is apparently a young woman, and the person in the center is a man. The third person is more ambiguous. And upon them shines a very big sun, in front of which a small angel, Eros, Cupid, who is very beautiful, like compared to the human beings, is preparing to shoot an arrow. So this card has like a lot of different meanings and usually it's about a choice to be made. It's about our love or, you know, uh, emotional or um, uh, like not, not directly sexual life, but about the, the world of attraction. But for me, the question that is asked by this card, which no one can really figure out. I mean, when people draw these cards, they're sometimes happy, sometimes unhappy. Um, 
it, it doesn't give a very clear message. And I think it's a very interesting summary of what our intimate life is. It does give clear messages when we're under the spell of hormones and neurotransmitters recently falling in love or lust. The message seems really, really clear. And then as we deepen the connection with whatever our situations are, whether they're sexualized or not, but in our intimate life in general, uh, there's always a lot of confusion. So this card also, you know, represents community at large and our family life and the way our um, experience with our brothers and sisters and parents have shaped our sense of intimacy. But for me, the question that is really crucial and that probably most of the speakers will try to address in a way or another is to know whether why this angel is a child. Why is Eros a child? In the, in the Hinduism, Kama is not a child and Rati is not a child. They're two grown-ups. Kama is love, Rati is desire or sexuality, basically, and they're represented as, you know, fully grown gods. But in our culture, in the West, I think most of us can consider themselves as products of the Western culture, Eros is a child. So that's the first question. Why is Eros in our heritage uh, something that is connected with childishness or, or childlikeness. And then the other question that's, that's very deep is, does the angel hide the sun or does the angel reveal the sun? In other terms, if we look at this sun as whatever we call spirit, like the cosmic dimension, the whole, the essential light, the source of love, warmth, and unconditional light, that shines equally upon everybody, is the little Eros a mockery or a like applied shadow on this sun? Or is it actually the one step through which we can access the sun? Another interesting fact in the traditional tarot, I mean, we could pass the drawing if you're interested, is that the, the, the bow of the little angel gives the sun the shape of a skull. So maybe we can pass it around. And then the next card, which is which has a um, very clear relevance, like iconographic relevance with uh, with card number six, with the lover is the card of judgment, of course, which is supposed to describe the last ju last judgment, but which usually stands for irresistible desire. I would like to make a parenthesis here and uh, go into the question of tantra. I think we're all more or less tantric here, <laughs> even if, well, you, you, were, you got drunk yesterday night, so. <laughs> if tantra is something, like I said to Jorge, it's about digesting poisons, so he's the most tantric of us all today, you know. <laughs> being hungover, what is more tantric than being hungover? <laughs> so I'm committed to a spiritual path that, that is tantric in essence, not in um, rituals. You know that basically in, in Traditional spirituality, you have paths where you have like a very limited amount of instructions that you need to chew on and practice forever and ever, like Zen, for instance. And you have paths like in Buddhism or in some branches of Hinduism where there's so many, you know, texts to studies and mantras to remember itself. So that's not the kind of tantra I'm talking about. And if we if, if I would want to summarize what I, under, what I understand as Tantra, and I'm not pretending to be right about that, I would say that Tantra is about the path in the world, so we don't remove ourselves from the delusions and temptations. Where we don't go into monasteries, we don't choose a path of renunciation, and we don't even necessarily choose to be householders in a monogamous way and you know accumulate riches and whatever but we go through whatever the five senses have to offer with a very deep uh, commitment that we will take both Shiva and Shakti, both the masculine, quote unquote, and the feminine, uh, uh, in love and, and in union together. And that means the convex and the concave. So that means love and loss. That means happy emotions and unhappy emotions. That means uh, praise and blame. And that means to basically um, be able, eventually, to um, stand witness to the energy that is at the base of any experience in a way that this energy enjoys and, and, and feeds and, and nurtures itself from 
whatever is there. So there's a beautiful tapestry at the Musée de Cluny called The Lady and the Unicorn that some of you might have seen uh, live or online in which this incredibly beautiful lady and her uh, lady-in-waiting experiment the joys of the five senses. And the last, the sixth tapestry is called To My One and Only Desire. And she's giving everything back in a casket to that one and only desire. So when we talk about irresistible desire, about the judgment, which is the de desire to be able to dare say I am, which is the desire to finally disengage from the illusion of being the separate entity, we're all to also talking about what the, mono the monogamous, yeah, monotheist and monogamous <laughs> religions <laughs> Are, um, are describing as the final judgment, the, the rising from the dead. It's not necessarily that we will be born again in whichever way. It's how do we rise, you know, like in, in, the, in the Sanskrit prayer, which means lead me from death to immortality. So that is the meaning of the judgment, which is also the card of the one desire. Of course, when you do a reading with me, it's going to be about your, you know, your call in life and, or maybe your relationship with your loved one. Or, but it's really essentially about the nature of desire. In terms of, we have so many different desires that are so many branches of the one desire, which is what? I mean, the, the, the proverbial question that the spiritual teacher asks the person who comes to them for the first time is, what do you want? What do we want? So this card is about the moment when the angel and the emanation in the sky become one. The angel has grown. He's become a grown-up. Oddly enough, the angel is dressed, which means that somehow we have chosen the same way that the, the characters were dressed in the former card. Now the characters are naked and the angel was naked and now the angel is dressed. So in the former card, we are, you know, our weight, our fortune, our beauty, how many hours we've spent in the gym to look good on the beach, whatever, whatever we put on. And now the human beings down there are naked, but the angel is dressed because you have to choose one way of answering the one desire. So that was a long introduction for whatever I'm gonna say next. I think, um, I would like to talk about two things, the way that the angel can hide, about the, the way the angel can hide the sun. Um, because I think the people who are here are going to um, talk much better than I would about everything that has to do with um, walking into intimacy and ecstasy with others and with oneself and um, all the delightful aspects of what we could um, describe in terms of how Eros brings us to the spirit. So, you know, if I had an hour to myself, I would do that, but I, I think we have some wonderful specialists of that. But what I, one of the things I would like to remind us is that if Eros is a child, that means we have to look at trauma, we have to look at wounds, and we have to look at whatever intimacy, love, and sexuality mean in our family tree. So I think one of the first ways that we could look at Eros and spirit is think about, okay, if I'm going to go through all the nuances of life, if I'm going to embrace my sexual energy, whether manifested or you know spiritualized in some way, whether genitalized or not, just lived in communion with the whole, am I even able to imagine the myth of my own conception. What was that moment when a man and a woman, for our generations, it was still a man and a woman, now there's so many different interesting ways, came together? What happened? Was there desire or just, you know, uh, reactive lust? Uh, how did the endless cosmic creativity turn into that moment where that specific shape and being that I have become happened. So literally, where were my parents? How old were they? How were their bodies, their hearts? Um, can I even 
dare to imagine what position I was conceived in. I mean, it's one of the things that the Mayas would do. They had like specific, a specific Kama Sutra for um, engendering, breeding children on specific days of the year. And can I face the fact that maybe I wasn't a child of love or maybe I wasn't a child of pleasure? And can I then think about how my grandparents conceived my parents? I mean, generally with the family tree, we don't go beyond four generations. So could you imagine your, all, f all the four couples of your great-grandparents having sex? Is that really crazy? And how is it important? Because we have to look at, at the lack of information in our history, in our family, in our current circumstances. Otherwise, the risk is that when we hear eros and spirit, we start to idealize whatever we're actually able to do. And I think what's wonderful is to go step by step and also face um, our limitations. And on the other hand, um, whenever a sperm meets an ovum, there is an orgasmic quality in that encounter. I think um, it's still available online. There was a beautiful imagery where at the moment when the ovum finally accepts the one sperm that is chosen, because you know, of course, that it's not a rape. You know, the Darwinian idea that the guys are like running for the fortress and they're like kind of like attacking it and one gets the prize. That's not true. There is like a call from the ovum to to make you happen. Is that Eros and Spirit, Giancarlo? <laughs> That's the way I look at it. That we all begin in a, sp a space of ecstasy, but that is cellular ecstasy. So from that cellular ecstasy, we can start to gradually rebuild our capacity to welcome ecstasy and to welcome the shadow, which I think the reason why, so that would be my second point, the reason why um, Eros and Spirit is a very complex subject and the reason why many paths and many religions have chosen to kind of like, you know, shut the doors and advocate for limitations. And also the reason why we have a lot of examples recently in the Tibetan tradition that the secret sexual tantras had been actually performed by teachers who claimed to be renunciates and then, you know, lured some of their young female students into becoming their dakinis and ending, ending up in situations where under the pretense of, of the deepest and most hidden and most sacred tantras, we are basically facing patriarchal abuse, trauma, and then women who speak for years and years and years and are not heard, yeah? So, Gyal Rinpoche, Kalu Rinpoche, anyone? So, why is it that the religions and the past have been so cautious about um, letting the sexual energy be what it is? That means a part of, you know, we have divine intelligence coming to us and we do whatever we can with it. We have divine or cosmic love coming to us and we do whatever we can with it. We live inside the great life that is the life of the cosmos and the planets, and we do whatever we can with our existence. And we are products of the creativity of the universe, which expresses in us through our hormonal and genital desires, basically in the most raw and crude ways. And paradoxically, that fire, because it's connected with the element of fire in a lot of the, at least Western traditions, has been seen as extremely um, dangerous. So one of the things I'd like to, and I would like to finish with that because I think it's already been a, a little bit long, is to remind us that in the non-medicinal shamanic traditions, Castaneda, the way of the eagle, Luis Ansa, et cetera, et cetera, um, the connection between sexual energy and power is very much um, stressed. Most of the black magic works with the sexual centers and through the se sexual centers and seduction and you know, finding someone who's going to be your lover in order to uh, drag you into black magic. You're laughing, but it's actually very scary because <laughs> it works. <laughs> and so I would like to remind us of a wonderful exercise that I highly recommend that was passed on to us by Carlos Castaneda, who said that 
uh, a person who's living in a traditional environment usually meets about three to 400 people in their lives. We as uh, city people encounter so many more people and the most urgent recapitulation we need to do in order to get our energetic filaments back is to recapitulate the people we've been intimate with emotionally or sexually. So it's a very simple process that I think all of you, most of you know, where you first recapitulate. Sometimes it's not that easy when you've been sexually active in the 1980s like I have, <laughs> before porn and the pill and AIDS. <laughs> and then you just breathe your filaments back in and offer them back out and do that for as many days or months you need to with one person after another. Yeah, I think the psychological and the energetic maintenance is as much as I have to speak for an opening. And thank you so much for bearing with me. Thank you, Marianne. Lots of food for thought there. Uh, Jorge Ferrer. Jorge is a clinical psychologist, author, and educator. He was a professor of psychology for more than 20 years at California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco, where he also served as chair of the Department of East-West Psychology. Jorge is the author of dozens of articles and several books on psychology, education, religious studies, and intimate relationship, including Participation and the Mystery, Transpersonal Essays in Psychology, Education, and Religion, and Love and Freedom, Transcending Monogamy and Polyamory. Jorge was a member of the Ezalin Institute Center for Theory and Research, where he also taught workshop on embodied spirituality. Jorge received the Fetzter, a presidential award for his seminal work on consciousness studies and was selected as an advisor to the Religions for Peace organization at the United Station. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you, Giancarlo. Uh, thank you, Marianne, for the positive tantric reframing of my hangover. Uh, <laughs> that, that really helped. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I would like to start like uh, three, like three uh, hypotheses about uh, Eros and Spirit. Um, and the first one is that uh, for me, Eros and Spirit or energy and consciousness or sexuality and spirituality are the same energy, but in different states of transformation. I experience like uh, the erotic energy uh, as kind of undifferentiated, pregnant of potentials, as more dense because it's so compact, it's full of potentials, and also kind of uh, uh, dark, not in a moralistic way or descriptive way, but in the sense that uh, we cannot see directly with the light of our consciousness those potentials. They need to undergo a process of transformation through ourselves, different centers, until they come out into our lives. So, uh, and then the, the second um, hypothesis is that uh, those two energies, they lead to each other. And I have this Mobius strip, uh, you probably are familiar with the diagram. It's like one side, it's the same side, but one side reaches the other side. And um, I don't know if you want to pass it or not. <clears throat> What I mean by this is like uh, um, whenever we plunge uh, deeply into uh, sexual erotic energy, the sense of the numinous, the sense of the sacred emerges. And whenever we uh, plunge deeply or highly, depending on what you prefer, the metaphor, uh, into the energies of consciousness, uh, the sense of the ecstatic and the erotic emerges. Uh, remember like the, um, you know, the raptures of so many mystics in some ways from Santa Teresa to Hildegard, not to speak about the Hindu mystics. Oh, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> and then the, the last uh, hypothesis is that those two energies, they, they need each other. Uh, they need each other. It's like an alchemical marriage. Uh, for me, it's not so much about sublimating one energy into the other, although that can have a function at certain moments, moments you know. And they need each other because, like, the energy of consciousness, like, uh, gives our vital energy, erotic energy, uh, illuminates that world, and also it gives, like, an evolutionary direction beyond more evolutionary instinctive patterns towards procreation or narrow hedonism. Nothing wrong about hedonism, okay? Just narrow hedonist, kind of narcissistic one, okay? And then the, the, energy, uh, the energy of life, uh, eros, uh, uh, vitalizes our consciousness, makes even an erotic quality to our minds, uh, and it also grounds our consciousness, like uh, uh, helps consciousness to get more fully embodied here. Uh, and I believe that like this kind of alchemical marriage is like super important for an holistic spiritual life. And when those two energies meet in the heart, 
It's a big party in the heart. So um, that said, like uh, we can ask ourselves, like uh, if this is so, why there is uh, following your, some of your thoughts? Why there is so many tensions uh, in the culture, you know, between sexuality and spirituality? Why so many people experience uh, that they are in in conflict or uh, in tension? And as Marianne mentioned, there is many reasons. There is evolutionary reasons. There is like a historical reasons, religious reasons, patriarchal reasons. We'll not go there. But I would like to offer you some distinctions that I think are important to understand that tension. <clears throat> and it's the distinction between uh, a sp sexuality that uh, is superficial uh, and a sexuality that is deep. A superficial sexuality is a sexuality that is disembodied, is hypergenitalized, it's kind of mechanical. It's the kind of sexuality that so many younger generations are learning today while watching porn or mainstream porn. Okay, and then, uh, but the deeper sexuality, uh, it's really uh, like uh, about like uh, opening yourself uh, into the mystery of eros. And uh, deeper sexuality is the art erotica. It's an embodied, holistic, connected to the heart. Con with consciousness and so forth. And the same with the spirituality, you know, there is uh, maybe like a more um, superficial or partial ways of spirituality that are like what I call a more heart chakra up spirituality that is like really about like cultivating the heart and consciousness in detriment or subjugating or repressing or sublimating uh, the, low, the lower, so-called lower chakras, right? Uh, at the service of uh, the aims of uh, spiritualized consciousness. But there is also a deeper or more holistic spirituality that is a fully embodied spirituality. It's an embodied a spirituality that invites all of who we are, including our sexuality, including our instincts, into the spiritual feast. And that's what I call a more mystical uh, spirituality. And of course, there is forms of dissociative mysticism as well, but we'll not go there. Uh, so uh, the tension is not between sexuality and spirituality. The tension is between the superficial forms and the deep forms. And uh, the deep forms join hands together in their openness and surrendering to the mystery. The mystery of life, the mystery of consciousness, two sides of the same mystery. Another um, area that uh, I think is connected to this kind of tension is that we have um, exile errors, uh, and probably not in this room, uh, these you know, practitioners were in Ibiza, but uh, you know, in terms of like the critical mass of culture, you know, we exile errors from everyday life. You know, we just keep errors for the bed or for dancing, but we have derotized life. And I believe that there is like one of those kind of uh, unwritten uh, laws of physics that is like the, the less the less erotic is your life, uh, the more sexual compulsion you will have, okay? I think it's like something almost mathematical. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so, and then also, we have also exile errors, not only from our everyday life, but from sexuality itself because of that kind of forms of like superficial or disembodied forms of sexuality, you know? And then sexuality becomes also derotized. It's like a, this search for like kind of like a genital pleasure that is not like a full body uh, erotic experience of life. <clears throat> so um, I would like to offer a few um, keys to rescue errors, uh, but I'm gonna drink water first uh, for the reasons, tantric reasons that uh, <coughs> uh, Okay, so a few a few keys to rescue errors, no? And uh, and the first for me is like uh, to remember to reframe the the intimate connection between the sexuality and life. Um, all of us were brought into this world by a sexual act carried out by our progenitors. Okay, we came into this world of shape and sound and this amazing dialogue that we're having and embodied love thanks to that energy, right? And uh, for me, of course, I think we'll all agree that uh, there is something secret about life itself, right? So uh, I would sometimes in my classes at uh, CIS at uh, California, uh, I would tell the students like this kind of a little mantra like, sex is life and life is sacred. Therefore, sex is sacred as well. Uh, um, sexuality understood deeply beyond uh, the cultural conditionings, beyond the, the biographical wounding, uh, is tapping into, into the source of life, the origin of life. And I think that uh, that's part of what I do in my more practical work, helping people to really tap into that 
deeper dimension of that energy uh, and, uh, and then allow your sexuality to emerge from that place versus from manuals or techniques or the ways that you have learned that is the right way to be sexual or and so forth and uh, some of them some of them could be valuable of course at times um, the second key is like um, to rescue in a not 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 in a non-narcissistic manner, uh, the spiritual dignity of physical pleasure. And this is very important. Uh, if uh, my friend Giancarlo, Mariana comes now here and with a needle and pinches me, right? My body is gonna contract. Pain contracts the body, but pleasure relaxes the body. Pleasure relaxes the body and makes it more porous, more permeable to both that energy of life, eros, and the energy of consciousness, uh, ingredients of a fully holistic spirituality. So um, sometimes also with my students, uh, they were sometimes because some of them, they were carrying like a, you know, a challenging baggage from um, problematic forms of Christian tradition about pleasure and guilt and things like that. I would tell them very simple practice, like, you know, whenever you masturbate, whatever you do, you know, whenever you reach the orgasm, uh, immediately tell to yourself, uh, I'm a creature of God and I deserve this pleasure, you know, and it helps some people uh, in that direction. And then uh, the other one is like uh, overcoming the, the, the duality, the dualism between the sexual and the spiritual intimacy. Uh, for many centuries, uh, it was believed that uh, God or the divine mystery uh, would love all human beings in a spiritual way through agape, uh, but non, not erotically. <laughs> Who are we? Who are we to strip the divine from its erotic powers? I mean, what an act of hubris, right? Uh, so in the same way that we participate, we can participate in divine consciousness, the divine also participates uh, uh, in our experience, no? And this is why probably uh, uh, more contemporary research in sexology like have shown some, some studies that uh, even people who are super secular, who has no spiritual affiliation of any kind, like uh, at the peak of the sexuality, sexual experience or organs, they start saying like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, right? <laughs> or Jesus Christ <laughs> or, or whatever, you know, like, uh, and there is something to it because that's, that's something that many of these people, they, it's not that they are intentionally saying, it just emerges from their guts, so to speak. And uh, I think there is a lot to it. <laughs> And then the last one, the last key is like to um, to understand like um, uh, eros the, as the dark womb, uh, the dark womb for all our vital and spiritual potentials. Uh, is where all of this is there, you know, want, waiting to emerge. Uh, and therefore, that is so important uh, for me or from my perspective that sexuality is an open soil. It's an open soil. It's not a soil contracted by a spiritual, uh, political, cultural, or personal ideologies. It's like a soil that is kind of open and uh, emerges spontaneously from connection to that uh, eros as a source of life that has its own codes, its own intelligence, its own ways to flow through us. So um, I'm going to uh, finish uh, these reflections, uh, bringing back uh, eros. Uh, uh, because, uh, but not the child errors, the, the adult errors of the ancient myth of Sakyan Eros. Uh, it's one of the most ancient myths of all. How many of you uh, are familiar with the myth? I'll not go into the whole thing, uh, but basically um, Eros falls in love with Psyche. And um, one of the things that we're being told in the myth, and it's very important, is that uh, Psyche and Eros are destined to each other. It's not that they are only madly in love, they are destined to be with each other, okay? It's like they used to say that like, you know, eros or sexuality without soul is vain, right? And that uh, soul without eros is um, arid, cold, and stressed and depressed. And this is what happened a lot in our culture, right? Going to the mind is like, hmm. So uh, in this myth that is really beautiful and I encourage you to study it in depth, like um, there's many acts in the, in, the, in, the, in the myth, but at some point like um, Saki tr makes a transgressions because uh, at first when they are together, like they consummate their love in the darkness perhaps like not consciously, so to speak. And, uh, and some of her sisters uh, who are devoured by envy, they say, you know, Eros must be like a horrible monster, you know, to hide himself in the darkness and not showing his true face, no? So at some point, uh, uh, Psyche, you know, lights a candle uh, and see Eros, and of course, it's the 
opposite of a monster is Eros, the god of love, the most beautiful uh, god uh, in the whole pantheon. Um, and then anyway, like, um, Psyche needs to go through a series of ordeals, going into the underworld, getting also in touch with the instincts, like getting help with the creatures of nature, you know, the rattlesnakes. And she needs to go through a rite of passage. And this is also important uh, key in the myth, no? Before encountering the creative matrix out of which it what originated, uh, Eros, she needs to go through a transformation psyche to be able then later to get married again in a second nuptials, that these second nuptials are in consciousness, you know? Second nuptials that uh, are celebrated in the Olympus. Zeus for, forgets uh, uh, Psyche and blah, blah. And then they go into the Olympus and, uh, and then they consummate their love. And two things happen, and with this I finish. One thing is that Psyche becomes divinized by this union, and Eros becomes humanized, okay? And uh, I think it's another another key here. And guess what? They had a baby. I don't know, you know, they had a baby. It's not a part of the myth that uh, people sometimes know. And the name of the baby, who is a girl, it's a girl, it's Voluptia, Voluptia, uh, who is normally translated as pleasure or joy, but whose ancient meaning is plunging into life plunging into life. So plunging into life for me is a definition as good as any other of a mystical sense of life. So um, I think I'll, I'll leave it here. I hope that was helpful or stimulant anymore. Thank you. Beautiful, thank you. That was great considering the hangover. <laughs> Raffaello, my fellow Roman, north of Roman. Raffaello Manacorda is an international tantra teacher and practitioner. He has been practicing Tantra for more than 15 years and has undergone intensive training in several styles of yoga. After completing an MA in philosophy, Raffaello decided to spend more than 12 years living in alternative communities and experimenting with radically alternative lifestyles. It was in these wild years that he first encountered Tantra, the rebel way to spirit. This encounter developed into a lifelong practice, first on a solo journey, then studying Tantra and Yoga in some of the best worldwide schools. Raffaello serves as lead faculty in ISTA, the International School of Temple Art, and teaches and lectures worldwide. He's currently enrolled in a PhD program in Wisdom Studies with Ubiquity University in California. Raffaello is the co-creator of the ISTA Practitioner Training, PT, ISTA's program for coaches and practitioners in the field of conscious sexuality. Thank you for being here. Let's take a breath. <laughs> ah, we are receiving so much depth of information through the channel of the word. So I kind of, you know, acknowledge that this is a lot. And each and every word that has been spoken so far has multiple level of meaning and semantics. I'll do my best to try and, and be simple as much as I can in the delivery because I do feel that we are addressing deep questions that, however, may also be put simply, um, or in a way at least that speaks to the, to the whole of us and to our bodies as well to, as to our intelligent minds. So let's see how I can do with that. There is always the question of definitions, which I both love and hate. You know, wh what, is, what is eros? What is spirit? And of course, we could spend hours on that, but I do want to name that for this um, contribution, I'm going to support myself with uh, the help of depth psychology, particularly the work of Jung that many of you surely are familiar with, whom in my understanding is actually one of the most tantric uh, practitioners and let's say philosophers that the West has produced uh, recently. And one of the things that Jung's depth, psycholo uh, depth psychology gave us is a pretty workable definition of eros and spirit. Let's start from eros. So eros would be that longing, that psychic longing that we humans have in more or less uh, power to unite with particularly with other sentient beings, whether that's you know humans but also animals, nature, trees, and it could also be, of course, translated to stars and the earth, whatever you want, but it's a longing to unite. So it's a very, very deep pulsion inside of us 
that, as I will try to illustrate, has given rise to, you know, to a lot of things. But we all can relate to that, right? With this, this longing to unite, this longing to be. And why do we do that? And the answer from depth psychology, which I feel is a very spiritual answer, would be because we desire wholeness. We desire unity. We desire totality. So this cannot be discarded. It's a very basic human pulsion. It's psychological, but as we'll try to demonstrate, it's also spiritual. And then we can decide what to do with it. Okay, so that would be eros. That's why, no matter what spiritual tradition you observe, they had to deal with the problem of eros because it is, you know, part of our human makeup to desire to relate. And then about spirit, of course, it's very difficult to define spirit. But again, I would like us to entertain the possibility that every spiritual journey is also an inner psychological journey, or an inner journey. When I say psychological, I don't mean only in the head. I mean a journey that has to do with our inner world. As you know, psychological comes from the, the root of the word for soul. So it's a deep uh, field. And again, using uh, Jung as an ally here, we could say that from that perspective, on a functional level, there is basically no difference between God, God goddess, and the psychological archetype of the self with a capital S, which simply means the psychic totality, like everything that I am in my inner world, if I could touch that, I could touch God. And maybe one could say both of those things are impossible because we're speaking about totality and how can we embrace the totality? Okay, great, but the journey towards it is the spiritual journey, or as I more and more like to say, is it's our psycho-spiritual journey. So it's a journey of knowing God and you know, relating to God, but it's also a journey of getting to know myself in my totality, which is a pretty big thing. So from that base, I think we can go into a workable um, approach of this problem of eros and spirit. Because then, simplifying things a bit, but we see that as, as the previous speakers noted, um, spiritual traditions took one of two main approaches to this problem. And we can call them the approach of perfection and the approach of wholeness. So the approach of perfection sometimes we could also be um, sort of seen as the more masculine approach would be, okay, you know what? If I am going to try and, and know God, this continuous longing that I have to relate in the horizontal plane, which means fall in love, sexual attraction, but even just the love for my child, the love for my pet, the love for my family, whatever, is a distraction. It's distracting me because it's taking my desire and longing for union into individual entities versus the totality. And I want to unite with the totality. So that's why I need to find ways and communities where I can be protected by those distractions and redirect my erotic longing to God. And again, uh, like Jorge was mentioning, some of the great mystics even of the West, like Santa Teresa, etc., you will find extremely erotic content in their writings. It's just that the, the eros is directed to God, not to you know, a lover or even a child. And we also have you know, the archetypal, maybe legendary, maybe historical story of the Buddha, who as soon as you know, he realizes that actually what I want is to know myself, maybe he wouldn't have said God, but he leaves his family with a newborn child. It's like that love for the wife and for the child can't, can't stand a chance, right? Compared with the love for God. So that's one way that humans have practiced to know God. And to the best of my capacity, it works. You know, otherwise it wouldn't have been around for so long. It has risks, it has costs, but it works. And that if we take it to the inner journey, would be the way of purity and perfection. So how can I perfect myself? How can I eliminate or polish the traits, the inner obstacles, the inner demons, the clashes, however you want to call them, that are poisoning, that are in the way of my quest for God? And of course, you can spend whole lifetimes doing that, and it's valuable and it's sacred. On the other side, 
there have been traditions and there still are today, uh, we could even say there is a resurgence of that, that are seeing things differently, that are somehow embracing a different, some people have said more feminine way, but these are you know, labels that we need to be careful with, uh, the way of wholeness, which means what if I embrace everything? What if my horizontal longing for my friend, my lover, my cat, my baby, is actually allowing me to connect to the totality? If, of course, I, you know, it's ideal or perhaps exaggerated to say that I could love everything because I, I will never have a chance to meet every human being on Earth, just to, to say that. But through my loving of different humans, alive beings, trees and whatnot, I get a taste, I get a vehicle towards the love, which means the expanding of my identity into the whole. That would be more the tantric approach to my understanding. And it's also got its risks and its pitfalls and it works. <laughs> Both work. So what do we do and how do we choose? Well, first of all, there is a temperamental piece here. You know, Indian spirituality, which is not alone, but it's definitely been a very, very prolific spiritu spirituality for centuries, has produced so many spiritual systems, right? You know some of them. Tantra, yoga, many others. And one of the practical reasons for that is because they recognize that we humans are different, temperamentally different. So for some of us, the way of perfection and purity will resonate. For some of us, the way of inclusion and wholeness will, will resonate. So we will choose according to our temperaments, according to our makeup, according to our different conditions in life, so that we can do the best we can in terms of our spiritual and inner journey. And of course, nowadays in modern society where we have so many choices and also we may you know, be considered perhaps a little feeble and changing of mind and changing of heart, we oftentimes choose differently in different parts of our life. And I'm sure that many of you sitting in, in this beautiful place have been practicing ascetic disciplines for a while and then try the tantric way. And then, <clears throat> you know, what, what do we do is a big piece of individual responsibility. But both of them have risks and on some level we could say you cannot have it both ways. You cannot have your cake and eat it too. You cannot be whole if you're perfect, right? Because wholeness means including also the imperfection, including the parts that are broken, including the parts that are not polished, even the parts that are dark, violent, in denial, la la la, selfish. So you cannot be whole if you're perfect. But you cannot be perfect if you're whole. Because perfection, as in everything, you know, if, if you perfect, let's say, uh, I don't know, a, a recipe that you're going to cook and you want to get to the mastery of that, you're going to have to take things away, not just add. So perfection also comes through elimination and polishing. So therefore, this inher inherent paradox makes it so that we can be humble and we can kind of understand that whatever we choose, there is going to be a cost. There is going to be a price to pay. And there is also going to be a risk, and I just want to elaborate on that shortly, because otherwise, one of the things that we're seeing in a Tantra world is that it is all too easy to say, you know what, here is a path of spirituality that actually allows you, not only allows you, encourages you to eat delicious food, to uh, enjoy nature, to make love and fall in love. Would you like it? People are like, yes, please, of course, but what are the risks? So the risk, you could say, and I think Jorge pointed to that somewhat, the risk of perfection is always death and sterility and the coldness of perfection, you know, the, the, the staticness of perfection, the coldness of it. And that means not living, not life. And the risk of wholeness, the risk of the tantric path has always been different flavors of chaos. You know, when you embrace everything, then where do you stop? Where do you put your limits? Where do you put your boundaries? How do you work with the immense amount of pain and strife that can be generated by spiritual practices if you embrace all? 
So that's the risk, and that's the pitfall. And then we need to choose that we need to be prepared for a journey that one way or another will be risky, will be dangerous, and will be fraught with some perils as well. So it's not like Tantra you know, is, is now the, the solution to just have your cake and eat it too, but rather it exchanges one risk with another. And based on temperament and based on inclination for some people, that's actually the right way to go about it. Great. So I have another point that I would like to make, and then I would like to share with you a couple of quotes, and then I'm, I'm complete. So the other point is, what happens when we take these two paths, not just to our individual spiritual journey, but to a community, to a collectivity, and then it becomes the question of ethics, you know, and the question of like having a you know, a world where we can be with each other as, as humans while pursuing a spiritual journey individually and as a collectivity. And funny enough, um, Erich Neumann, who uh, Jorge was kind of pointing at, he's, he's written a lot about the, the myth of Eros and Psyche, but he also wrote, he was a, a, a disciple of Jung's, he also wrote a beautiful book on what would happen. It's, it's an imagination because we don't have that yet. What would happen if we had a society based on the ethics of wholeness? It's very different from where we live. Like, for example, from that standpoint, in a society that is based on the ethic of wholeness, psychic wholeness, then to be evil sometimes would be considered as ethically sound and good. It's like, hey, you're a whole human being, you know, you need to be an asshole every now and then. That's fine. Whereas to be pure and, and in sanctity and holy and in, you know, perpetual goodness and love would be, mm, what's wrong with you? You know, like you are kind of repressing something. There is a part of you that we cannot see. And so there is a whole different system of values that, can be that would be created. But nowadays we don't have that. We are still living on the tail end of about 2,000 years, at least in the West, of um, religions and societies that have been strongly, strongly anchored in the idea of a god, because it starts from there, that is unendingly and infinitely and purely and only good. So therefore, when humans try to imitate that God, obviously we create a different kind of society, one in which everybody's trying to be a good boy or a good girl, and that's fine. But the risk with that, the, the danger of a society based on perfection and purity, is that on a societal level we create a scapegoat mentality. You know, a mentality of point holier than thou kind of thing, of pointing out, you know, well, look at you, look at you, look at you. You know, you seem to be pure. Now I've seen you fall down. Ah, I knew it. It's happening very recently, and as you know, with very public spiritual characters. So I'm not, I'm trying, you know, not to enter into any judgment of that, but we need to be aware that right now we're still living on a 2,000 year at least uh, period of religion and society based on the quest for purity and holiness and sanctity and infinite goodness because that's the God that we have worshipped. So therefore, that's the imitation that we have been born into, most of us. Of course, I'm generalizing here because I don't know where each one of you grew up, but more or less. So there is this vision, there is this possibility that maybe in the future there will be a time or an era where morals and ethics and spiritualities get oriented more to, this, to the principle of wholeness, to the principle of embracing it all, which of course means fundamentally getting to know our shadow through different ways, and getting to embrace it, getting to include it, getting to eat it and digest it, which is not for the faint of heart. But that, to me, is the real tantric path applied to today, and that's the path that I'm striving to embody. So before I leave you, I would just like to read a couple of quotes that I found um, in the Red Book, the Red Book by, again, by Jung. If you have a chance, I would really, really recommend that you get intimate with that book. It's not just a book, it's an object, it's like a a physical manifestation of an inner journey, and for me, it made me cry, it made me reflect, it made me... It made me, you know, pray and so many things. And some of the quotes from there are really powerful and short. So the first one says, If the God is absolute beauty and goodness, 
how should he encompass the fullness of life, which is beautiful and hateful, good and evil, laughable and serious, human and inhuman? How can man live in the womb of the God if the Godhead himself attends only to one half of him? That was the deep contemplation that, that these human, of course, you know, the, forget the masculine pronouns, but um, it's a way of speech. And then, on the same line, Jung spoke deeply about the ambiguity of God, which I would also rephrase as paradoxicality, like God is a paradox. And so he wrote, that is the ambiguity of the God. He is born from a dark ambiguity and rises to a bright ambiguity. Unequivocalness, which means certainty, is simplicity and leads to death. But ambiguity is the way of life. So for me, if I substitute ambiguity with paradox, if I substitute coming from a dark ambiguity into a bright ambiguity simply means infusing our paradoxical existence with consciousness, with awareness, looking at the paradox that we are, looking at the paradox that God is, expanding our heart. It's, it's a stretch that's going to tear us apart because the, the totality is very fucking big. But if we expand our heart so big that we strive to contain totality, we might just as well explode, forget who we are, and for a moment, know God or know ourselves, which is the same. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Another very rich. Thank God we recorded. But uh, Maria Teresa di Calcutta wrote uh, erotic stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Santoshi. <laughs> Santoshi Amor is a well renowned international tantra teacher, fully devoted to the path of self discovery and personal transformation for the last 25 years. Her presence and both her passion and spontaneity encourage participants to discover hidden aspects of themselves. Her work brings individuals into authenticity and love. She's the founder of the Ibiza Tantra Festival, the International Tantra Woman Training, and the Tantra Woman Team. She let go of her career as an architect to follow her heart and live at the Osho community in India for 12 years, where she became a tantra and meditation teacher. After leaving the community, she retreated to the Himalayas for over a year to practice Tibetan Tantra. Coming back to the West, she traveled and taught Tantra in more than 17 countries. She's now based in Ibiza, fully devoted to support women to bloom into their higher potential. The Tantra Woman Training runs in different countries and is becoming widely renowned. Thank you, Santoshi. So I don't know how you are by now with all these words. First of all, oh my God, really like, wow, we have amazing speakers here. And I have to move away from the microphone, from the speakers. And um, I don't know if you could hear what it says in my whatever description of myself, but um, I'm not a speaker, yeah? Um, I never chose to teach Tantra, and I don't teach Tantra. I just live, or do my best to live Tantra. Since uh, life put me in, in an ashram where Tantra was lived 25 years ago. Yeah, and that was absolutely mind-blowing. And for me, that's Tantra, mind-blowing, yeah? So you can hear a lot of words, and my God, I could not add anything to these speakers, because everything they say, I 100% agree, so I wonder how we are going to debate, but maybe, maybe it's needed, maybe it's not needed, because actually, Tantra contains own, including the debate, we can even fight, yeah? But uh, I don't know if I need to speak anymore, or just... Um, like my aim, my longing. They talk about desire, they talk about longing. I, I connect with that longing 
My longing would be to give you one minute transmission, one minute of what Tantra is. And then I would go like, wow, yes, yes, yes. And then maybe you will have some thirst in you that you know is there. That's why you came here and that's why you're sitting here. And it goes beyond sex. And sex is great. I love sex. But it's just one more. What Tantra teaches you is that you can meet God every moment here, sitting, listening, looking, <sighs> feeling my breath, feeling my nipples, caressing my dress. And this mic that when I took it, I thought, wow, it's actually a great, <laughs> nice red mic. Ooh. <laughs> very tantric. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm already getting, woohoo, eros. Yes, eros. Eros happening in my witnessing presence. That's it. That's it. Whether I'm walking, whether I'm talking, whether I'm looking in the eyes of a friend, anything, washing the dishes, making love with my lover, doesn't matter what position I use, doesn't matter what I do, but can I allow Eros to be expressing itself in the silence of this very moment? That's Tantra, and that's magic. And when that happens for a single second, you know whether you are in a peak of orgasm or you are just dropping into someone's eyes in the middle of the jungle. Then you know, and that got you. Yeah, and that, that um, vibrates with the longing that... Uh, that Rafa expressed so well of becoming one, because this is what we are longing for. Because we come from oneness and prum, I'm half body, sorry what to say, the new, whatever, I'm half. And I'm longing to merge with the other half, because when we are merging with each other, suddenly we become one body. We are close, closer to that wholeness. And we are longing to go back to that. And in the meantime, we have all these fantastic circles that every moment can remind us where we are. And if you know who you are, then who cares? You can do anything, <laughs> anything. We can all get naked, throw our clothes off, and jump in this gorgeous lake now. I'm playing the water like little kids. And then what? Then we will feel so alive, so much eros. And who cares whether I'm married or not married or... Yeah, but it's not what we do, but from where we do. I do it because uh, I wonder, da, 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 da. or it's just because life is moving through me and uh, it's inviting me to move to the next. And I don't know where I'm going. I prepare nothing, sorry, sorry. I prepare nothing. I was supposed not to be here. A gorgeous, gorgeous woman. Uh, my sister was supposed to be here, amazing Tantra teacher, highly recommended. She couldn't come, so I came in her place. I said, I'm not a speaker. So, okay, let's see what I can share. Yeah, so, okay, I will just share two words, but it's again the same that I said. And then actually I would invite you, if you want, to experience a little Tantra with me. But of course for that you need to want it. Yeah, it's like we can talk, right now, right now we talk about how it would be if we all swim in the pool and what happens and you get out of the pool and you feel more alive and you feel wet and sorry, unless you jump in the pool, you are never going to experience Tantra. Okay? And uh, relax, I'm not going to ask you to take your clothes off. <laughs> not yet, but you can, come to, you can come to one of my gatherings, maybe, anyway, whatever. Um, I'm not here to make publicity of anything. <laughs> um, but I wanted to say two words, you see, two words. So yeah, for me, Tantra is uh, that. It's energy and, and energy, and everything is energy. Anything is energy. Energy and consciousness, making love every single moment, now, and now, and now, and now. And when you realize that you are that, now, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter that we are, I am crying, rolling in the floor. Okay, yes, pain is there, but I can even enjoy that. 
And this is not because I read in a book or someone said, sorry, it's my experience. And it's beautiful because it makes me alive. If you've been close to death, if you've been close to death, the moment you open your eyes and you feel fear, you feel so happy because you feel something. It means you are back from death, it means you are alive. Yeah, but we are so afraid to feel certain things that we keep ourselves half dead. So Tantra invites you to be alive and to know who you really are. And once you know, then oh, let's play. But of course, in all the ways, shadow, light, everything is part of one. You cannot only take one side, sorry. You want to be fully orgasmic? Great. Then you have to be daring to embrace the biggest pain. And that's how it was, because it's all energy anyway running through you. How much earning you want to, how much energy you want to allow to run? That's your choice. So I think you want to practice a little bit of Tantra or you want me to talk more? It's your choice, huh? Should I ask the audience who wants to practice? Hands up. Okay, who wants more words? Hands up. I think you lost. Sorry, but I wanted to ask. <laughs> we are in Ibiza, you know, we love it. <laughs> Okay, anyway, it's going to be something super simple, like really. Um, okay, so I'm already, actually, I may say I'm wet. <laughs> Sorry to say, but <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like <laughs> just, just to feel, because I'm nervous. This is energy. This is fire running through my body right now. So I use this nerv nervousness because, oh my God, can I, can I really give a transmission of Tantra to these people here and now? Can I? I don't know. Blah, blah, blah. That's my mind. So, whew. okay, let's go for it. Let's see what happens. Um, so unfortunately, I need to ask you to allow your eyes to close for a moment. And this is just because if you allow your eyes to close, then you have much more capacity to feel because eyes and mind go directly together. Hmm. So just with your eyes closed for a moment, I'm going to invite you to really feel your mouth. There's so much juice in your mouth. And now feel how your tongue is resting there. And I allow you to let your tongue become softer and uh, Maybe that's a little bit inside your mouth. And maybe you need to open your mouth a little bit. You know, when I was, I was in a nun school when I was small, and they told me, shut up your mouth. You know, don't get flies go in. Well, in Tantra, we tell you, open your mouth. And when you are making love, if you have your mouth closed, stop. Oh, yeah, open your mouth. Yes. Oh, and bring a little bit more air in. Air is oxygen, yeah? And they teach us to breathe less and less because the less you breathe, the less you feel, the more you think to buy this and buy that to make you happy. So breathe. <laughs> okay, see, see. And feel your tongue mm? for a moment. And see if that's okay for you to do this or your mind is already taking you to something else. Where is this crazy woman telling me to do? I don't want to do anything. Okay, just bear with, this me, with me for a second. And um, maybe you can um, bring your tongue out a little bit and feel your lips. Ah. <sighs> Feel your own juiciness, because often we are hungry, looking for juiciness outside. But unless you own it, what do you have there to share? And juiciness is there, it's just waiting for you to be awakened. Yeah. Mmm, yummy. Mm. And, um, mmm. And then maybe you can just take your fingers and, and caress your lips too, or your face. Mm. And notice if you can feel pleasure. 
of course you can go to other parts if you like. I mean, feel free. Everyone's with their eyes closed anyway. But maybe it's not even needed, you know? They, there is so many pleasure points in your, in your face already. Or you can shampoo your head a little bit, you know, to take away all these thoughts, this mind that takes you away from life. And mind is not bad, it's a great instrument. It's just a stance on the way. It's, it's a busy secretary. Can you tell the busy secretary to take a holiday for a few minutes and just feel, feel pleasure? Are you able to give pleasure to yourself with your own fingers? And as you caress your face, maybe you can take away that personality, that persona that is okay. It's also Tantra, it's also part of who we are. But sometimes we can take also a break and be in nobody, just energy expressing through this body. And then maybe from there you can move to your own hands and feel the caress of your own hands. How does it feel? Often we want to be touched or we want to touch someone. But do we know how that feels? Do we know how do we want to be touched? Or do we know how it feels when we touch someone? So can you, have, can you find pleasure by touching your own hands? Right now. Right now, pleasure is the expression of God in you right now. And if you are 100% there, you are already one with all there is. Eros and consciousness expressing through the pleasure in your hands now. And notice how fast you go. Because often we move very fast because this mind is so fast. Like in sex, bam, bam, bim, boom, like in the movies. Oh my God, I didn't even have time to breathe. They are already. Can you go even a little bit slower? And notice what happens if you slow down. What happens? Don't try, invites you to explore. then from where you are, letting go for a moment and just notice, see how present you are, how, be, how much is your mind interfering with the moment. Can you just let the touch go and just listen to this gorgeous nature that is surrendering us just for a minute? Let those birds penetrate you? So if your mind is thinking, oh, let's think something that's boring, then you will, it's okay, you are still here, you are still Tantra, but you miss, you miss a moment of wholeness and pleasure. It's a lot of pleasure in fully listening how the sound of nature penetrates you right now.
then I invite you to open your arms and touch someone sitting next to you. You may not know who's sitting there. It doesn't matter if it's someone from the same sex, man, woman, who cares? It's another human being longing for the same than you. Just notice how it is during your presence there. Maybe just choose one, choose only one. And bring, bring one hand or two hands there and explore this other body. And see if you can find pleasure there. if you can find peace there or whatever is there what is there And the last, and yet not the least, to let go of the touch and turn to one of those bodies you were touching and just allow your eyes to open and receive another eyes. Just receive like an ocean in front of you, full of mystery. You may know these eyes, you may have never seen them ever in your life. And you don't care. Yes, because you are penetrating the mystery and you are being penetrated by the mystery. And just notice what's easier for you to penetrate or just to open and be penetrated by the mystery in those eyes, now. Ah, and the breath can keep on flowing. Sometimes the breath stops because, oh my God, there is so much intimacy. If you really want to receive, of course, sometimes it's like, ooh, this is too shaky, too shy, so the, the breath blocks. And then there is separation again. That's okay, that's also Tantra. Maybe you can keep on breathing and expanding in the sensation of shyness and, and keep on opening or keep on penetrating deeper the mystery. And when you realize that mystery is there, then magic is happening for you. And it can happen any moment in your life no matter what you do. Of course, if you bring this to the moment where the tip of the penis is resting in the cervix of a woman in total relaxation, many, many, many aspects of you are meeting in oneness. Now, if you are not able to do what you are doing now, I think it not, will not be easy, very, very difficult in sexual intercourse. So this is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you. I hope it served. And it just came like that. I've never done this before. <laughs> and it was not planned. Thank you for following. Thank you, Santoshi. So where are we going from here? <laughs> There's not going to be red team versus black team. Um, I feel the talk was so complementary, right? From a Jungian perspective, to a tarot perspective, to a mythological perspective, to a very experiential perspective. So I will ask you maybe just one round, um, and I will ask the speakers, is there anything that you think that came out in this hour and something that you would like to underline, to clarify, 
as a takeaway for the audience? You know, maybe something with some uh, experiential value. Any question, any clarification, any comment, any, any, you know, it's not going to be a debate. It's not going to be a disagreement. <laughs> but uh, anything you want to ask to each other? I was really taken by uh, all the presentations, but uh, I want to comment on the, um, you know, your distinction, the Raphael, on the part of path of wholeness, path of um, perfection or renunciation in a way, you know. And, um, you know, like you have, uh, have studied like mystical traditions for, for decades. Um, and, um, and I really found like with a few notable exceptions, like uh, historical traditions, they virtually all had like this kind of um, uh, not very positive perspective on sexuality and sexual desire. No, it was demonized in Christian tradition, it was a klesha in the Buddhist tradition, um, in the Jewish tradition as well, uh, they should perform the sexual act with no pleasure uh, in certain uh, tendencies. And then the, um, I always had this question, and also I bring this question for, for all of you and for everybody, it's like, uh, why, you know, why, you know? And, uh, and you, you, you brought apart like the distraction, no? uh, or what it was perceived as a distraction, and the focus on uh, the connection with the divine in consciousness, in your heart, and so forth. You know? But uh, I've always wondering uh, um, if there is like an underlying um, evolutionary reason, you know? Because uh, I mean, we could perhaps hypothesize, as another wild hypothesis, no? that um, at the dawn of uh, the emergence of human species as we know it, you know, um, at the dawn of the emergence of self-consciousness, of the values of the heart, you know, that are so important for us now as a community, of, um, um, it could be likely that those energies and values were not very, not, not as strong as they are now. And that, uh, and that they could run the risk of being reabsorbed by instinctive energies uh, that probably for hundreds of thousands of years were organizing human life with its light and its shadow. <laughs> um, I mean, we can remember also there is a lot of um, documentation about sexuality in the Middle Ages, and it's not pretty. Uh, the bestialism, the rapes, the, I mean, it was bit bad from <laughs> our standards, no? And uh, so no wonder, no, many of these traditions, they would say like, you know, that, that's, that's a path of perdition, that's a path you need to stay away. But it's not anymore. It's like, uh, and this is where I think the two paths come together, I think, in our time. So they can come together in the sense that uh, now our self-consciousness is very strong, our values of the heart are very strong, and we can re-engage those strong instinctive energies without getting lost, unless we participate consciously in a kind of Dionysian orgy or something like this. <laughs> and then you just let it loose, you know? And uh, I don't know, it's like a thought, it's an hypothesis I've had for a long time, and I don't know if anyone wants to comment or have a different view or from the audience as well. Uh. I could uh, build on that and, and maybe bring a little bit of controversy, not, not on purpose, but just touching some controversial topics because one of the things that can happen, I feel, when we start looking at these different um, spiritual traditions that have been so antagonistic to sexuality, and we, 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 we do one plus one, and we also recognize that we're mostly founded or led by men, mainly, you know, the spiritual practitioners were kind of all men, so it's kind of, there is an easy way out, which is to say, oh, okay, let's go back, you know, let's undo, press undo on all of that, press undo on 2,000 years, and let's go back to a more, uh, if not matriarchal, but matrilinear form of transmission of, of spirituality, and uh, indeed, um, an understanding of the world and the cosmos that was more embracing. However, and this is very difficult territory, because, I mean, even me speaking about this, I cannot have an objective perspective on it, because I'm inserted in this uh, evolution, but oftentimes I think, look, there is another way to, to look at this, which is what happened, happened because it was a violent, painful way for consciousness to differentiate itself, which I think is what Jorge was pointing to, to a ver from a very primal, instinctual, totalitarian way of being one with nature. When I say totalitarian, I'm, I'm, you know, playing with words here, but it also means, you know, in, in again, in depth psychology, that would be said in the words of, look, the great mother 
is beautiful and welcoming and also completely devouring. And this is also the experience of a child, you know, the difficult experience of a child when, when you leave the maternal womb, not just by being born, but by growing up, it's oftentimes through contrast and through saying, I'm not you, and I don't like you, and I want to go away, you know, and it's, especially in teenager life, there can be quite a bit of antagonism there. So what I see right now, and it's very, again, very difficult to speak about this from my limited individual consciousness, is that it's not so much about going back, but how do we move forward? And we have drank also the bitter cup of what it means to, to remove ourselves from nature so much, which was maybe necessary, but so much, that actually, you know, to put it very simply, we almost drove our species and to extinction or to some kind of cataclysmic event. So, but what's forward, from my perspective, cannot be just a return. And that's why all the, I think I have a little bit of personal controversy with all the language that sometimes we use in this circle of, of going back to. Going back to this, going back to that. Actually, we don't go back to anything. The future is so mysterious and so exciting because it's unknown. It's never happened before. We have never been in this moment before where we could look at these phenomena and talk about them and embody them and then manifest another way of being which have no idea about what that is. But in order to do that, we need to be willing to leave the temptation of the return back. Because in the, in the life of an individual, you know, if you are 45 and you say, you know what, I've seen the world, it's very dangerous, and let me go back to my mother, you'll be, well, that's not, that's not the way forward, you know. Just, just thank her, derail her, and, and create a new relationship with the mother and with the father that's exciting and new. So thank you for bringing that. Well, I think we are moving forward. I think very clearly the past ages, we were kids as humanity. So it was us and God. So us, we were the kids and God was the big father. Now, what we are, humanity, we are fucking teenagers. What do we like? Traveling, sex, you know, adventure. We are in the teenage time, so we are moving forward. Huh? <laughs> Of course, you know, there were levels within, yeah? You can be a conscious teenager or less conscious teenager. <laughs> yeah, so that I wanted to say. And then about Tantra being a dangerous path, of course. Of course, it's, I think it's much, well, easier. Nothing is easy, no? But when you don't have any distractions but to sit in silence and meditate and realize consciousness happening, it's a little bit less distractions that when you are going into all the telenovela of relationships, one after the other, and heartbreaks, and because, you know, sex with all the emotionality that we have pendant there, it's, it's a big elephant that uh, we need to face in this, in this tantra world that includes everything. So when it's so wide, there is, it's very easy to get lost in the means and not to reach the essence, no? I was very touched that we all basically agree, and I think it's the <clears throat> the feeling of also the people who are here that we are, at least us right now, collectively interested by a kind of path that is an all-encompassing or a path where instead of rejecting things, we go into opening up the sense of what is mine. And the one thing that occurs to me now, after Santoshi's beautiful... Um, Exper experimentation is that I, I don't have any big ideas about where humanity goes or where it should go. I, I kind of, the older I get, the less I understand that. But I'm very interested in practice. And uh, as a writer, as a singer, I mean, you know, the things that you have to do, you have uh, people who practice yoga, you get up in the morning. How do we practice? And so, how do we practice this path of opening up? you know, like the Sufis say, you will enter whole in the paradise or you won't. So how do we practice this path where like Pema Chodron could tell us, you know, go places you don't like, love your enemies, etc. And I'm remembering a word from my teacher's teachers from Sri Swami Prajnan Pad, which maybe will be relevant for some of you. Um, he was talking about bhoga. Bhoga in Sanskrit describes sexual enjoyment. But it also 
talks about what you cannot avoid. So, you know, you wanted to go out and it rains. Are you going to argue with the rain? Or are you going to agree to have the bhoga of the rain? So for me, it's a really big... Um, it's something that helps me daily to make love with whatever arises. And I've started by trying to be interested in it and then maybe try to um, consider that it might be friendly and then try to love it. And I think the ultimate um, point is to be able to actually enjoy it. So let's enjoy our lives. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to frame a question within what you said, Rafaelo, about uh, you either aim for holiness, um, wholeness, or holiness, or, or you know this kind of spiritual kind of uh, impeccability. And recently, I think it's it's something which comes up over and over is that you see spiritual leaders, uh, gurus, masters, which aren't impeccable, that they're fallible, they're human. So my question is: Okay, going back to the thing of practice and how we make sense of this. Should we expect the guru, the master, the sensei to be impeccable even though he is then amputating a part of his own being, his own spiritual experience on earth? Or, or do we expect them to hold themselves up to a higher standard? And how we, how we console these two things? Because often we expect the shaman to be a holy man, to be a saint, but then he's not or she's not fully in their own uh, journey. So, so do we expect them to make a change in adjustments? Do we expect us to make a change in adjustments? This is the question I'd like to ask. I want to say, first of all, that for me, in the new paradigm, gurus and masters, they don't exist anymore. That was past. Now it's us, the Sangha, who is here now. And the way we grow is that we reflect each other. We reflect each other's shit, and we reflect each other's light. And it's karmic. If you come to me with your shit, of course, your shit is going to affect me and I'm going to respond to that. And there is nothing wrong with shit and light. We hope everyone has both. Yeah? And that's from there that we grow. So this, like, again, this is the little kid and the high, no? I look up and he looks like perfect, so I want to be like him. No! You are unique. There is no single person like you in this world. And you have a gift. And if I see your gift, I'm seeing mine. And we shine together. And we shine by reflecting each other, by polishing each other. So for me, it goes more from that perspective now. No? So then I, I, don't, I, can, I don't look up. I look in. It's a great question, and there's so much that we could talk about that. But, um, I think there is, on the one hand, like a... Uh, those situations, like to really approach them with uh, both firmness but compassion as well, because uh, many of these teachers and masters, um, and I've known some of them, and shamans also, they got into these kind of sexual scandals and things like that. There is sometimes cultural reasons, uh, okay, I'm not justifying anything, it's cultural reasons, but ultimately also there is also, I think there are symptoms of what I that call this kind of heart chakra spirituality, in which some of these people are having an awakening in their consciousness, and they believe they're fully enlightened but other parts of themselves are alienated uh, but many of them developmentally are like pre-adolescents or adolescents I feel like uh, shamans like uh, psychic healers venerated in their communities behaving like pre-adolescent boys around um, attractive women or women that they consider attractive and um, so there is there is all these dimensions and of course at the same time you know we need to uh, you know like tell them as you are working in this culture you need to also learn that there are certain things that are not cool because especially if you are hurting and the other thing I would say is that uh, uh, it's very tricky because um, we only hear about the bad stories. We only hear about the stories that go wrong but uh, I, I've heard stories of friends of mine who had actual sex with their um, Zen teacher, for example, a very old Japanese Zen teacher. And uh, for her, she was a very strong practitioner, very powerful, and uh, she has nothing negative to say. There was a transmission that happened for her. There was like a, so I believe that uh, we need to look at uh, critically, but also with the sermon of its case, individually, case by case, because otherwise, like, uh, what kind of like, 
you know, just not making the, the distinctions that I think that could be helpful for, for our own guidance and for our own life. Um. When we go back to a place where we are going to be taught how to grow in a way or another, we go back to a context that is akin to being inside our family. So when someone goes, even if it's a therapist or music teacher, whatever, and it would be uh, crazy to think that one person can be perfect. I don't fully agree with you on the question of the teacher or not the teacher. I was very much against the teacher question. I think spirituality is like sexuality. There has to be a lot of different configurations that fit a lot of different needs. But I think we can all agree that we need a context that has integrity. So that if one person slips, the context itself becomes the teacher force that holds one person's incapacity. I mean, we are all instructors here and we know that we can slip in many ways. And I mean, I think younger instructors, when I was younger, I thought I would never slip. And then I made a lot of mistakes. But I always seek to place myself in the context that had integrity. When the context doesn't have integrity and the individual slip, might be time to seek support somewhere else. I would also like to comment, great question. It's very dear to my heart and it's a very complex question. And so if anything I say sounds like a simple solution, it's, it's on me. There are no simple solutions with that. And there is pain, there is, you know, when these sleeps happen, obviously we're dealing with people's hurt and emotions. So, but what I want to add to what has been said is that one of the most profound cultural shifts that hasn't happened, that might happen in spiritual communities and elsewhere is how do we react psychologically when someone's shadow is exposed, you know, in a way that potentially harmed other people? Because that will happen, we can all agree, you know, it's, it's inevitable. And imagine for a moment, what would it be if we came to a place where we can celebrate that? Of course, you know, care for the hurt and the hurt people, but regarding the person whose shadow was exposed, go like, oh, look at that. That came up. Now here we have a compassionate but also clear process to deal with this, which is going to support you into looking at this, digesting it if you're willing. If you're not willing, then we need to consider our relationship with you. You know, if someone is not willing to digest their own shadow, there may be a question, well, do you even, like we need to reframe the relationship. But supposing that the person is willing, so they get invited into an exciting process that is beneficial to them, but also to the whole community. Because this is one of the big points that psychologically, whenever one person, especially a very visible person, is willing to meet a piece of their shadow through a process and come out the other end, there is an element that's transpersonal. It's not just them, you know, it's partly them and then it's a transpersonal piece that may have to do with a million things. So they're actually somehow then making the community's immune system and inner health stronger by doing that, by agreeing to do that, by being willing to do that. And therefore, if we come to such a place that will help also for those people whose shadow is coming up, not go into an immediate response of defensiveness and like, oh my God, you're talking about excommunicating me, that means death, that means starvation, this is very primal stuff in our brain. And so it, this is just a vision, it's not clear yet, but I know that one piece is, of course there is the person that has the, the slip, but also how do we as a community react to that? Can we say, oh, amazing, here we are supporting you. And yes, you need to go through this process, but it's all of us going through it together through you. And I think when we, when we envision that or when we come that and when we can create an example of that, we're really supporting the move from a scapegoating culture, which we still pretty much live in, to a culture that is collectively willing to address and digest shadow. Thank you for your question, it's great. More questions, comments? I was uh, thinking about this concept of spanda, 
that uh, Daniel Odier really loves, and I, I really love this concept too. That is more than a concept, that is a sensation. And sometimes I wonder if the psyche and eros, when they get in contact, maybe this panda moment is this moment of uh, when the skin creates this energy of erotism, when there's a erotism energy, it's kind of uplifting in another energetical dimension, the whole inner and outer world. So. I feel, that for me, the spanda is like the meeting point between two, and I don't know if uh, you share this sensation or, or you want to debate on it. <laughs> In French, we say frémissement, but yeah. I don't know how to S translate spanda it. Spanda is like the fluttering of a butterfly's wing, and it can be... I mean, I've experienced it more as the result of going from stillness into movement back to stillness and being able within stillness to feel the movement. For me, it's very close to the notion of suspension in dancing, in tango or other forms of dancing, and the function of the silence in music. It's this idea that where we think there is, where the common mind thinks there is nothing, there is actually this essential rhythm pulsating and that's only the first step, but we shouldn't go too deep into that. Thank you for bringing it up. With, um, <coughs> with regard to what was said uh, about uh, the tension between the uh, philosophies or religions that seek spiritual advancement and the eros energy and sexuality in general, could it be that is related to the patriarchal agricultural society's um, attempt to control feminine sexuality. In my understanding, um, in mythology, the female represents life itself. And uh, that will connect also with the ecological crisis. Like we've been living for years, for centuries, in an attempt to control both nature and woman woman's sexuality explicitly because of the implications uh, in terms of my genes or someone else's genes inheriting my land, my kingdom, etc. <clears throat> Could it be that then the religions, the different religions or spiritual uh, philosophies that uh, have sort of uh, repressed or, or, or um, hidden that part of, uh, of life, has is a direct result of these sociological, historical conditions that just happen upon humanity, uh, and maybe in the hunter-gatherer societies where the females are having sex with everybody and the children are children of the tribe, from those societies it will never emerge a philosophical path or a spiritual path. Sorry that uh, repress sexuality because sexuality will not be an obstacle. The moment you try to control something, you have to go to war for it, you have to, you have to use violence, you have to really, you, you get on a path that consumes a lot of your attention and resources and that is very far away from God. So it does make sense. You're either warring your neighbors for the, for the woman and you're, or you are going to God and doing away with all that. Could, could that make, uh, could that be? Um, I would say that uh, yes. <laughs> I, uh, my sense is like the, um, you know, women, uh, nature and body has been in the patriarchal imagination, the unholy trinity, basically. They have been fear, as an, something that is uncontrollable and that needs to be subjugated and control. And uh, I think there is a lot of uh, tragedy there uh, historically and still in our contemporary times. Uh, not long ago, I was visiting uh, Iran and, uh, and there was still this is the culture, uh, political, ecclesiastical, that uh, you know, forces women to cover themselves, as you all know, possibly. And uh, the, the rational, the rational that is quite uh, striking is the rational is that, oh no, we're doing this to protect them because if men see their hearts, they will rape them. And it's like, wow, right? And, but this, this is connects with what, what you're saying. It's like this, like this, there is this, uh, maybe in, in less, I don't know how to put this, like uh, I think it may connect also with what we were talking before evolutionarily, that there is still in some places in which 
some men that couldn't control their instincts. And of course, the tragedy is like, man, get your shit together and don't force women to do things that they don't want to do, right? But uh, it's part, it's one more sign of, of that kind of like uh, unholy trinity for, for the patriarchal imagination that has been prevalent in religious history for millennia. Again, great question. <laughs> a few comments on that. So yes, um, if we look at mythology, there is a relatively clear moment way before Greek mythology and Sumerian mythology where you can see the emergence of, of very violent myths of male gods slaying female goddesses. One of them is Tiamat. Uh, but the interesting thing is that those male gods before, they were the sons of those female goddesses. So it's, this is really like uh, an archetypal story of the female divinity generating the male one and the male one growing, growing, and then at some point rebelling violently and basically taking her place in a violent way, like, like a coup, you know, something like that. So that's definitely true. However, again, I think there's a few pointers here that are important. First of all, those hunter-gatherers, that's us. You know, it's not like th the movement from hunter-gatherer to agricultural, which required a way of subjugation of nature because, you know, with uh, agriculture and even more when humans started to subjugate animals and have livestock, right? So, but that's that's still us, you know. It's not, not some other <laughs> person. It's just that for some reason, that movement happened. And as Jorge was saying, also, if you look at the history of mythology and religion, there is a moment where there is this immense fear of the feminine, as in the body, the emotions, sexuality, but also the dark, fear of darkness. And that's when the religions and mythologies become so entranced with light. It wasn't always like that. You know, It wasn't always that religion was equated with light, or sorry, or spirituality or, or ascension. So what happened there? Of course, we can take it as a mistake that happened for some reason, and like, how can we turn back? But as I said before, it may also be that two things. First of all, it was the struggling consciousness developing and having to like, violently extricate itself from itself, if that makes sense. It's, like, it's not an orderly and harmonious development. It's a bloody development that made a lot of damage. But also, and here I'm connecting to the transmission of a, of a woman mystic, modern mystic that I like a lot, and her name, her name is um, Sabine Lichtenfeld. Some of you know her. She's one of the founders of Tamera, where she had these downloads in, in, in Europe that the drama is much deeper than that. You know, the drama has also to do with the feminine archetype becoming tired of this male son, you know, wanting the, the male energy to grow and to meet her. Not to be just like a good boy, you know, that, that stays in the maternal womb, you know, and, and adores the mother. It's like, okay, this happened for a few thousand years, now grow up. But according to her transmission, as I interpreted it, as in her wisdom, as she sort of released the male energy to grow, she also knew that as part of this growth, this male was going to become aggressive and violent. That was a phase. And so she almost, from a place of power, not from a place of subjugation, said, okay, then if this is the way, let it be so. Because this is the way. So the way that we can, it's easy for us to cast the feminine archetype from a good-hearted place into a fragile, weak, you know, victimized place, actually. And it's easy for us to do the same with nature, by the way. Poor nature, and, you know, and, and at the same time, it's easy for us to romanticize both of the feminine and nature. So, for example, our vision of nature right now as modern people, that actually nature is nourishing and we can't wait to go back to nature, that's great. But human beings for millions of years have had to face the wrath of nature, and how dangerous she is, and how annihilating she is. 
So the relationship is very complex. And we should never forget, that's at least my, my feeling, that the feminine in all of us is mighty. You know, it's powerful. Yes, she may be hurting, but she's mighty and powerful. And the masculine in all of us has this complex relationship where he wants to meet her in power, but historically he hasn't known how to meet her in power except with taking power forcefully and violently. And is there another way forward? That's what we are all sort of like looking at. So I think, yeah, we can talk about the mother and the son archetype. But the, um, the sedentary uh, civilization has brought us to other very interesting archetypes that might be relevant for today. That's the feminine as the lady and the ethics of chivalry in the masculine. So, for instance, at the miraculous virgin chapels, La Milagrosa, or Notre Dame uh, de, la, de, de la Rue du Bac in France, Joseph is holding the baby and she's free to have her hands, you know, emanating light. She doesn't have to be Magdalene to do that. Maria, the lady, can do that. So I think that's very interesting because on the one hand, of course, there's everything you describe and they beautifully kind of recontextualized. But there is something in the Middle Age and Renaissance um, mythologies that we can work with. I always like the idea of working on an inner level where my masculine becomes the knight that kind of like worships and protects the ladyship, that kind of holds the ground while the, in the insane, wonderful, super powerful feminine dances in dimensions that I don't even want to look at. So that's kind of a little twist that I wanted to bring. <laughs> Thank you. I have a um, short little sharing, which comes to be, become a question to both of you, be able to answer it. So first, it's a lovely experience to sit here and observe, also trying to define the same thing, which is indefinable in many ways, talking about divine eros, and how we can put words to something that is so deeply experiential and, and vast, infinite. Um, I like sometimes to use a word called true nature, true nature, a way to describe the emptiness and infinite of, of all potential. That we, that we are all sitting here as children or teenagers trying to uh, um, mentalize, conceptualize. That's just a sharing. My, my question is, this is something I'm very curious about. I have a theory, because in this true nature of manifestation, as I said, the complex chaotic origin of how things happen and evolve are too great for most minds to even be able to consider, to understand what is the cause of effect of us ending up here, what is the patriarchal age, the feminine age. But a, a theory I have I would like to share is that, so I look at the patriarchal driven by the fear of survival. And I ask myself, I suspect there are cosmic evolutionary reasons, a cause for the effect of the patri patriarchal age to come in. And for those of you who are aware of the Younger Dryas age, the, the potential emergency we had on this planet about 12,000 years ago, I have a theory that for sp perhaps spiritual reasons, I cannot give that answer, there was a drastic change that caused humanity to go into a crisis of survival that invoked the patriarchal, patriarchal age that we lived. So I'd like to share that theory and, and get a response from it with the ingredient that everything has been exactly as it has had to be by definition that it happened for us to evolve on a greater collective scale than I can and perhaps any of us can actually define. I think, there's a, I think there's a question there. What I would say is, is a huge uh, philosophical question. Uh, 
and there is, has been a lot of answers to that. There is two camps. In, like there is some camps that actually they wouldn't agree with that. As in some camps, they say, well, we, we did make some mistakes in the way we developed uh, and evolved here in the West. There is other indigenous people, for example, in the planet, you know, who develop and evolve in different ways, you know, less, con less disconnected to nature and so far. So there was something about uh, the, the whole cortical development, the cognitive development that also gave us so many fruits. So there is so many things that are valuable there, you know, but also that disconnect us in ways that, uh, and this is the question now, were they necessary or not, right? And uh, some people say they were necessary, or people they say they were not necessary, you know? It's like, a, it's like a, let's bring it to our personal development, no? Like, a, you know, as kids, we are, as Freud, Freud would say, we're polymorphously sensual, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it seems developmentally, you know, the, the, when the development of, uh, of the mind, the cortical reason and stuff, there is like a repression of all that, you know, latency and then adolescence opens up again in a more genital and all way, those energies, you know, right? And uh, there is like some kind of repression happening there. Is that really truly necessary? Is that really truly necessary? Is it wouldn't be a way to raise children uh, that they could still develop all these cognitive abilities without having to go through that kind of repression, like more physical contact, massage, I mean, who knows, you know? So um, uh, I don't have a clear question, the answer to your question, but uh, I like to play with all these ideas because uh, yeah, there is, yeah, uh, there is a lot of viewpoints around that. So it's, it's really good, good question. Thank you. What I will add to that. Um, again, I want to bring it also to temperament. Some of us are more past oriented and they're able to look at the past and, and make sense of it and construct also an embodied lived experience of the past that allows us to move forward with a baggage, you know, not making the same mistakes, etc. Some of us are more future oriented and they actually are bogged down by the past, individual and collective, and just need to feel free to, to vision and create. And there's more, more complexity. So I think there is a place for, for both, for reflecting on the past, individual and collective, and moving forward. One thing, though, that I would be careful with is the feeling, how much space we can and want to give to the feeling of guilt, to the feeling of regret. Some of it is definitely healthy and important, because otherwise, you know, we're just like flying around and, and not leaving the embodied reality of the consequences of our actions. Again, individual and collective. So, for example, the consequences of patriarchy, we can elaborate on that, and then the embodied sense of, of those consequences is important. Yet, at the same time, it's, you know, from a tantric perspective, I, I would say it, it is as good, it is good as long as it enlivens the body, it, it allows us to reflect and to act more with more integrity, which by that I mean with a more integral view. But the moment that guilt starts to contract the body, to shut down, to, to make us basically dwell in a place of like despair, then from my perspective, some future orientedness is a good medicine there. Because as you said so beautifully, by definition, what happened is what needed to happen in order for us to be here now and look back at it. There is no other possibility right now. So therefore, while digesting it and feeling it, it's also, in my feeling, this is personal because I'm a very future-oriented person, it's urgent to de devote our psychic energies and, and physical energies and erotic energies to the future that we want to dream and imagine. And by future, I don't mean like in a thousand years from now, I mean, what's the next step? You know, what can we do right now? So that's my contribution. Yes, I think we are ready. Thank you for making the two hours the people uh, left. Any, any question, anybody? Yes. So. You know, I'm a, I'm a little bit <laughs> I'm a little bit puzzled because you know I I had this vision of black team red team tantra tantra is the right framework to you know combine god and 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 and, and, and eroticism and sex and 
and but then we went such in a macro way into uh, the past and the future and the teacher and ethics and but it was great i was amazing to see you guys um, engaged and uh, we want to do more of this right we are yes we want more ideas you know of 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 maybe a little bit more debate also um, so thank you, thank you everybody. Now we can get naked and go into the pond. We can open some wine. Thank you, thank you. Coca, sonara, sonara yente. 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 Coca, sonara, sonara yente.